place was great until we got here. Uh, <clears throat> until we get, we start, get, before we sing. Um, thank you. Um, on Tuesday night, we'll have our uh, guys meeting here at church at 7. On uh, Wednesday, we'll have our Wednesday evening service. We've been meeting in here together. The young people, the young, the children going on back to their classes, but uh, adults meet in here. We sing some songs and pray together and then look into God's word. So if you have an opportunity, come on with you. And I encourage you to be here at 7. Um, the senior adult class is meeting again in my office at 10 on Sunday morning, so I encourage you, those who are interested in that, to come. If you need a book, we have the new books for the next quarter, and so see Kathy, and she'll be able to get you to fix you up with a, a new book if you need that. Um, next week, we're going to do a couple of fun things, I think. Um, the weather, and this is weather permitting, but we're going to uh, go outside and have church outside next week, okay? So we're going to meet out here in the in front of the church and uh, so what we need your help a little bit bring us some lawn chairs or something to sit in we have a we'll take a few of our chairs out but if you might be a little more comfortable if you have your own and so bring that and uh, we'll be worshiping outside uh, next Sunday in the open air no masks required so just uh, keep that in mind and uh, we will uh, then after the service next Sunday then we'll have our Labor Day Sunday picnic so I encourage you to bring food for your family and uh, the lawn chairs again, and uh, we'll just uh, use the grass out there, the lawn, and uh, enjoy a time of fellowship together. So that'll be next Sunday morning after the service. So uh, keep those things in mind for this week. Um, before we begin, we have a young man who is celebrating a birthday this week, and uh, I think today maybe even, but uh, um, Kenny is uh, 39 years old this year. <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, we, we are we are happy for Kenny, and uh, we want to congratulate him and uh, let him know we love him. So it, we could sing Happy Birthday, but if I lead it, it's not going well. So we don't want to. I don't know how we want to do that. We want to sing to Kenny. Let's sing to Kenny. Happy birthday to. for worship and for our time in the presence of God this morning. So as we pray, uh, Connie, would you lead us, please? Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. <laughs> Close to your side. 
wants to be followers, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man. Thank you. See. Um, there's a. We have some cards going around. There's a kind of.
rather small, so we have two or three of them. Um, uh, Bill has just been sick for the last couple of weeks and still doing okay, but not, not she's not well. And so we'd like to just uh, encourage her and let her know we're praying for her. So if, I don't know where the cards have gotten off to. They may be on the table out there. But if you haven't signed it yet, please do that before you leave and just let her know you're praying for her. And uh, we're going to pray for her here in just a minute as well. Um, we want to also be in prayer for uh, our missionaries. We're praying today for the folks who serve in Uruguay. Um, our work in Uruguay was started back in the early 60s, I believe. And uh, we have two missionary couples that are serving there, the Torresons and uh, the Lancasters. And uh, we want to pray for them today and for the work there. We have, I don't know, uh, several Free Baptist churches in the country, uh, both in the, city, the capital of Montevideo and then up along the Brazilian border uh, that Uruguay shares with them. And uh, so let's pray for the work in Uruguay this morning as well. And let's remember to pray for each other and pray for God's blessings and protection as we live each day and as we serve God each day. So let's bow our heads in prayer once again, and uh, let's remember to pray for these things. Diane, would you lead us, please? Uh, just a reminder that if you'd like to give this morning, we don't, we're not receiving the offerings right now, but we do have boxes back by the door and just drop it in there. So, uh, and then you can also give online if you so choose to do it that way as well. So, but let's uh, continue our worship time. Let's stand and let's continue as we read God's word. Romans 12, 9 through 21. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring one another. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God.
not ashamed of our Savior who took our place on the cross of Calvary and bore our sins, carried our sorrows, and even though the world esteemed him smitten and stricken of God, Father, we see him as the hope of the world and the joy of our hearts. And we're not ashamed of our God, a God who dwells in the heavens, a God who lives in impenetrable light, a God who is too great for a human form, a God who is too great for us to contain in our finite minds. Father, we praise you for all that you are, and we thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Lord, that you're our God, and you're our God not because we chose you, but because you chose us. Thank you, and we praise you today. We shout at that news to everyone that we know. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you see. Well, we'll dismiss our children to go to kids' church. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I want to ask you a question this morning, and I want you to think about it a little bit. What would you do? If you knew that this week was the last week you would be on earth, what would you do if you knew that come Friday you would leave this life and be ready for the next one? Now that's a somber question, isn't it? Um, it's a kind of a note that we don't often like to think about. But we need to think about that. I mean, how foolish is it of us to not be prepared for something that we know is going to happen. Now, we don't live every day like we're going to die, but at the same time, we do need to be confronted with that. But what would you do? How would it change your week? Would you get up and go to work on Monday, or would you decide, what, don't need to do that? School, no, you don't have to worry about papers, right? You're not gonna be around to write those papers or to hand them in, so uh, don't have to worry about that. Would you take the credit cards and uh, have a good time this week and run up the, you know, the old credit card debt and just leave it to somebody else to worry about? What would you do? I think it says a lot about our values. We think about that, how we would answer a question like that. Would you take the time to spend with your family this week? What would you do? Now, why would I ask a question like that? Well, we're looking in John chapter 12, and as best we can tell, this is the John is telling us about the last week of Jesus before the cross. In fact, we're entering into a really interesting passage here in the Bible. Think about this. We think of the, the life of Jesus and how important it is. But this last week of his life, when we begin with actually thinking of Saturday, beginning with the, what we looked at last week, the last couple of weeks, with the anointing of Jesus by Mary at the banquet, Beginning there and culminating on the following Sunday, it is probably the most important week. Well, let me change that. It is the most important week in human history. All of history comes together during that time, that time frame. Jesus knew as he entered into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, he knew five days from then that he would be on the cross. Would you like to know that your day is coming and what day it is? What your death would be like? I think most of us, I think we would say, well, you know, I'm pretty good with having that information left to somebody else. I don't need to know all of those things. Because how would it affect us if we knew dates and times and places and events and and occurrences and all that would be around that. 
But Jesus lived with that. He knew that. In one passage in the New Testament, it says that he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem because he knew that he was going there to keep an appointment. An appointment that would have been made from the beginning of time. And now it's all coming to this moment, this place, this time. Matthew devotes eight chapters out of 28 that he wrote about Jesus' life. He devotes eight to this final week. Luke, excuse me, Mark, out of 15 chapters, 16 chapters, he devotes six. Luke, out of 24 chapters, he devotes six as well. John writes 21 chapters. Ten of them are from Saturday, eight days to the finals, the, the Sunday of the resurrection. You think it's significant? In fact, John devotes five chapters to one night. We're going to begin that in our next, our next time. So we're approaching what is the most important passages of the Bible. And so today we're going to take a look at this. Um, let's read again our passage in John chapter 20, verse 31. Read this with me out loud. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So, you know, here before long, I'm going to have every one of you stand up and repeat it by yourself, you know, just see if you remember it. No, I won't do that. But, uh, nice thought, though, right? So, um, today we're going to call it the final countdown. Um, we're looking at the final week of Jesus' life and that time before the cross. And so we're gonna go through this, um, and I, we're gonna break down and read the scriptures. I wanna just briefly touch on the first eight because we've been talking about them quite a bit the last two weeks. Um, and I think what we find out when Mary, and her worship of Jesus and the way Jesus responds, what we find out is that true worship and love connects with him. Now, it's important to emphasize the word true. Because we can come and we can sit in a service like this and not worship. We can, we can talk about loving the Lord and it not really be true. But true, honest, from the heart, worship and love for the Lord, it connects with him. Because he said, wherever the gospel is preached, what Mary has done will be remembered and it will be talked about. It's like he's saying, this is the way that you do it. This is the example. Love me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And you maybe put it in a negative way. If your heart's not in it, don't bother. Don't bother. Now let me ask you this. Does the way that you love the Lord and live for him, does it cause others to remember and follow your lead? Are you an example to follow? Now, I don't think we set out to do that. We love the Lord with our hearts and we live for him the way that we want to and the, the, the way the Lord has laid it upon our hearts. But I think I, I remember people in my life that have been examples for me, that have helped me, encouraged me in, in my walk with the Lord. And I think it's good Are you to answer a question like this. Are you leading people to Jesus or are you leading them away from him? Would, if someone followed you around for a week, would they come to the conclusion that it's good to follow the Lord, or would they decide, man, that's not for me? The Bible talks about the fragrance of the perfume as, as Mary anointed Jesus' head and his feet with this tremendously powerful essence, this, this nard, that the room was filled with the fragrance. Is the fragrance of your life sweet? Or put a little fake, a little vulgar in it, or is it a stinker? What do people see when they look at you? And you may think, well, that's not important. Well, I think it is. The Bible says that we are the light of the world. That we are testimonies, witnesses to what the Lord does in, in lives. 
And so I think that's a good question. And so I think, first of all, when we look at this chapter, one of the things we learn is that true worship and love connects with Jesus. But I think we learn so much more. I think, secondly, we learn if you want your life to count, you live for him. And notice, I want us to read verses 9 through 11. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, when he, him arriving in Jerusalem, remember he's been in Bethany, and just a couple of miles away, and now he's, he's making the, the short walk over to Jerusalem. When the, all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him, and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Notice this. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Now, it's, it's interesting. This is the final miracle Jesus does before the cross, before the resurrection. Okay, you don't read of anything else during this week. But what a statement. The one who can call death, life from death. The one who can give life back. And it says that even the, the Pharisees now are even after Lazarus because of, because of him, because of the witness, because of what God, the Lord has done in his life. A lot of people are becoming followers of Jesus. It says it calls them a large crowd. Lazarus is sort of a freak of nature. I mean, no one comes back from the dead. And here it is happening this close to the capital city. And so God used Lazarus to draw others to Jesus. And I think God will use anyone to draw folks to the gospel. I wonder if it would amaze you, and I think it would, to know how God is using your life to draw people to him. You ever think about that? Most of us, we look at our lives and we think, well, I'm pretty insignificant. Nobody really watches me. Nobody's really paying attention. And I'm going to tell you, if you think that, you're thinking wrong. Because I promise you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a follower of him. The Holy Spirit is using you as a light to the people around you. And that's why I say it's important the way we live and what other people see. Because we are the instruments that God uses. You might be amazed to know how God is using you and the difference you're making. Live for Jesus and you will make a difference. Live for Jesus and your life will count. Now, there will be a cost. Some people aren't going to like it. There were folks who were wanting to kill Lazarus too. Not just Jesus, but Lazarus as well. Now, they may not threaten your life, but there are going to be some folks that, you know, there, there are days when, you know, as believers we're in Jesus, we're not real popular. I don't know if you noticed that, but that's, you know, there are a lot of folks that would say we're just, we're the part of the problem. And they don't see that what the Lord has done in our lives is what the world needs. Lazarus was a walking miracle. But you know what? So are you. If the Lord has changed your life, if he has transformed you from a sinner to a saint, if he has made a difference in your life, then you're a walking miracle. Because no one can change their life. Not like that. The Bible says in John chapter 9, verse 32, Jesus said, or excuse me, in chapter 12, this very chapter, verse 32, and we're going to look at it again later. And when I am lifted up, Jesus says from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. You might say, when I am lifted up in your life, I will draw all men to myself. So when people look at your life, what Jesus are they seeing? Are you lifting him up high? Now, I'm not saying are you out there, you know, with a big old Bible and just getting in everybody's face and preaching. Now, that's okay if God calls you to that. But are you just living your life every day? Are you concerned about what you say to the cashier at Walmart? Do you, do you give concern about coworkers and what you talk about with them? Do you think about your fellow students and how your, your life is living out before them? Do you think about the impact that you're having? Because if you're a believer, your life is counting for something. Don't be afraid to live it out. Don't be afraid of what someone else thinks. Live for Jesus. Third thing we learn from this chapter is Jesus is never going to be what the world is looking for. 
It's just not. Um, now, we're going to notice in verse 12, we're going to look at what's called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We're going to read that this morning. It says, the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. The disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead. Hard to, hard to argue when you've seen it with your own eyes, right? And they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about the miraculous sign. Palm Sunday is a, is a fulfillment, or it's, it's a, in, the response of what the people at the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But notice this, then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Now I want you to get the picture here. Jesus is coming down the road. Bethany was on the other side of the Mount of Olives, so he's coming through the Mount of Olives. He has to come across the Kidron Valley and then up the hill toward Jerusalem, he kind of sits on a hill, okay? He did in that day, the old city. And so as he's coming and people see him leaving Bethany, and I don't know if the parade started there, but people started gathering around and they started lighting the roads and they, they took palm branches from the trees and they started waving them in the air and they started laying their coats and their, their garments in the road before him. These were all things that one would do for a conquering hero, for, for someone who was important, for, for someone who had political power. I imagine there were a lot of emotions. Some thought, this is our Messiah. This is our king. He's going to come. He's going to overthrow Rome. He's going to send Pilate and Herod packing. And we're going to have, he's going to, with the power that he has, if he can raise the dead, he can do anything. And so Israel is going to once again be great. It's going to be like when David was king. They saw only political benefits. The word Hosanna, which is, I think, used in King James, it says, they said Hosanna. The meaning of the word is save us, save us now. They were looking at him to save them from the powers around them. It's interesting that Jesus chose a donkey. In fact, a colt of a donkey. Um... <laughs> I don't know how much you know about donkeys. I know very little. But they're kind of squirrely looking animals, aren't they? Got the big ears and the little bodies. and the, They're stout and all that, but they, they're just not very big. And they're not very impressive. You know, why not get a stallion, a big white horse, and put him on the horse and maybe give him a sword and, and let him ride in like a victor, like a, like a, a, a general who has just captured an enemy. Jesus chose a donkey. Doesn't he always surprise us? Let's go back 33 years to Bethlehem. Instead of coming in in blazing light and, and, you know, fire from heaven, he comes as a baby born in a stable to a little peasant girl. Have you ever noticed Jesus isn't really into the flashy? <laughs> we love flash, don't we? We love the, the big show. My family and I, we watched last night the, the Greatest Showman on Earth, the story of P.T. Barnum, and he loved the show, man. Bells and whistles and lights and odd things and strange, all this going on at one time, a three-ring circus, right? That's what we like. That's what we go after. And Jesus keeps coming to us in humility. And he looks like us. And he didn't come to save the, the powerful. He came to save people who needed a Savior. 
I love in Romans when Paul tells him, he says, look around you, brothers. There's not many of you here that are noble. There's not many of you here are rich. There's not many of you here are powerful. But God has chosen the lowly things of this world to confound the wise. God has always done that. And we see it here. In fact, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy from the Old Testament. In Psalm 118, it talks about the Messiah coming and entering Jerusalem in just this way. And Zechariah 9, 9 told the folks, your king would come riding a donkey. In fact, the colt of the donkey. And so Jesus is just fulfilling the prophecy that was made hundreds of years before this day that the Messiah would come. It's also interesting that the disciples, John and Miss, they didn't get all this stuff. They weren't understanding all of this when it was happening. It was only afterwards that they started putting things together and studying the scriptures and finding out what he had done. But understand this. If you're going to live for Jesus, you're never going to be in the flashy crowd. Shouldn't be. Church isn't about lights and smoke and loud and long and it's about worshiping from the heart. I don't care what you do outside, what's going on in your heart when you worship, when you're here. That's what he looks at. God has never been impressed with a show. That's why there's no reason for us to put on, try to be something we're not. We might as well be honest because that's the way God sees us. But a fourth thing we see is that bringing people to Jesus is the greatest act of love. In verse 20, verses 21, 20, 21, and 22, the Bible says, Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. That seems like a kind of an innocuous passage, not a lot going on there. But why did these Greeks come? I love this. Sir, we want to meet Jesus. We want to know him. Why did they go to Philip? You know, we don't hear a lot about Philip in the line of disciples. But Philip is the only one with a Greek name. Now, the Jews didn't like the Greeks. You can probably tell as we go through a lot of this, the Greeks didn't like a whole lot of anybody, right? They didn't like outsiders. And these Greeks that came from other parts of the world, they were... They were just sort of, they kind of looked on them as the know-it-alls and the, you know, the Greeks that had one time been in power with Alexander and, and you know, they kind of lost them, but they were still the cultural, you know, force in the world and, and uh, the Jews didn't, just didn't like them very much. But the Greeks, I guess they assumed that they could go to, to Philip and he would uh, give them a listen and so they wanted to, to meet Jesus and Philip goes to Andrew. Andrew is Simon, is Peter's brother. In fact, the only time we know, we hear anything about Andrew is he's always bringing people to Jesus. You remember when, when Jesus first started his ministry and Andrew heard him, he, he ran to Peter and he said, let's go meet Jesus. You've got to meet this guy. You've got you to hear him. I think he's the Messiah. And he brought his brother to the Lord. And later on, when Jesus is preaching by a, a seashore and they need lunch, Peter finds a little boy with a, with a bag of you know, a bag for lunch and a few fish and a, some pieces of bread and, and he brings them to Jesus. So it seems like with Andrew, he's always bringing somebody to the Lord. I don't know, maybe he wasn't as powerful a speaker as Peter. Maybe he didn't have the personality that Peter had. How would you like to be Peter's younger brother? How would you like that job? And that's where Andrew was. He may not have had just, you know, a whole lot of, he may not have been a real deep thinker. I don't know, maybe he was. But one thing we do know about him, he knew enough to get people to Jesus. I think that's a pretty good trait. How about you? You don't have to be a theologian to invite people to Jesus. You don't have to, to be a great speaker to let people know what the Lord has done in your life. One of the simplest things to do is just to invite someone to him. By the way, the only reason we invite people to church is so that they can meet Jesus. Right? I mean, what else is the point? Do they need us? Do they need to hear how great a speaker I am? No. They need Jesus. 
That's the bottom line. If you're going to come here, one thing you're going to hear is we're going to preach him because that's our message. That's our hope. That's all we've got to offer. I think that's a lot to offer. The world needs him. You need him. Your friends need Jesus. The people you work with need him. Andrew got that. We need to be more like him. And I think there's no deeper love than the people who will take the time to share with somebody else who needs him. Can we really say we love someone if we know that they are without the Lord and we know where their life is going to end if they go into, they die in this life without him and we say nothing to them, can we really say that we love them? Can we really say that we're a friend when they have such a tremendous need and we have the answer? We know what they need. We know who they need. And we say nothing about it? What does that say about us and our love? I believe the greatest testimony of love is when I'm willing to help someone I know to meet Jesus. And then we move into the last part of this chapter, the last passage. And, and Jesus, in verse 27 excuse me, back in verse 23. I don't think I have it on the screen. But uh, he makes the statement, the hour has come. Now, it's interesting. These, these people from out of town, these, these Greeks, these people who are not Jews, they come and they want to meet Jesus. So, so Philip and Andrew bring them to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He starts talking, he says, my time's come. What's he doing? What, what, you know, hi, how are you? It's good to meet you. None, none of that. Just my time has come. The hour is here. What hour is he talking about? The hour. The cross is right before him. The cross has arrived. The day, the moment he sees it. We're probably at this point, we're down to Monday or Tuesday of the week. I mean, it was just a couple of days away. The hour that he's been living for. The hour that is the most important moment in all of human history. We still look back to that day. The hour has arrived. And notice what he says. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory into my name, and I will do so again. These Greeks, they didn't realize that they had arrived at the culmination of history. That they had arrived at the most important moment in time. And I think that's what Jesus was saying. What you're about to see, what you're about to be a part of, is don't miss this. Notice in verse 30, 33, Jesus says, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging the world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he's going to die. Think about that. He knew the cross. He knew what was ahead. He knew what it was going to be. He could see the nails, the crown of thorns. He could feel the pain of the lash of the whip across the back. Could you walk into a moment like that? Knowing what that was going to be? Knowing what awaited you, having a way out, and not taking it. That's what Jesus was dealing with. And notice in verse 27, he says, Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? No, this is the reason I've come. Glorify your name. 
I think sometimes we want to whitewash this because we think, well, Jesus was God, and it wasn't the same like if it would have been me dying, Jesus somehow didn't feel what I would have felt. No, that's not true. Understand that he was in the flesh 100% human. Everything that he felt, you would have felt. Everything that you would have felt, that's exactly what he went through. In fact, he was so consumed with this thinking about what it was going to be that you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's praying, his sweat becomes blood. That's actually a, a physiological thing that can happen when a person is under great stress. If you think the cross was easy for him, think again. He even prayed, God, if there's any other way. But praise God, he prayed the following words, not what I want, but what you want. If he would have taken the easy way out, you and I would have had no way. But he took our place. The pain was great. The suffering was great. And remember, everything he did, he did in your place. But not only that, the need... The need was urgent. Verse 35 and 36, the Bible says, Jesus replied, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. After these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. Let me just say, I listened to, I did not watch the, the uh, political speeches much the last couple of weeks, but I have taken the time to watch the two candidates. And I'm not trying to offend you, and I'm not trying to take sides here, but I'm sick and tired of hearing people talk about bringing the light. There was only one light, and his name is Jesus Christ. And following a political candidate and thinking that they're going to be our Savior, and they're going to bail us out of our problems, we are building our house on sand. It will not happen. There was one light, and his name is Jesus Christ. You can have all the protests in the world you want to have. And you can, you can walk and you can, you can lay down your life. But trust me, the only way that we will ever change this world is by offering them Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. He is the hope. We are never going to have change in this world until we have change in the heart. That's the problem. We think we can change attitudes and we can change minds, but we need to be changing the heart. You want to know where people need to love others? They need to love them from the heart. Then we won't have racism and we won't have these problems that we deal with because we will be loving them in his name. Red and yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight. That's why he came. That's what it's about. That's what the cross means. You want to offer hope to people? March is fine. Go march. But that's not going to solve the problem. If you're going to offer hope to people, you're going to have to offer them Jesus Christ. He is the hope of the world. He is the hope of our lives. And if that offends you, it's not me that offends you. It's the gospel. Because that's what the gospel is. I have to come to the place where I say, I can't do it by myself. I will never be right with God. I can never change my heart by myself. I need a Savior. I need the one who gave his life for me. Believe it or not, it's up to you. The Bible says, I don't have it on the screen, I don't think. I don't think I do. No, no. In verse 37, it says, even after all of this, they still wouldn't believe. There was a bunch of folks, and I, they're still around today. It doesn't matter. They're never going to see it. And then, by the way, there's even a sadder group, though. If you get down to verse 42, the Bible says there was a group of folks who, uh, they believed, but they were afraid of the folks in the synagogue. And they were afraid that they were going to get kicked out. They thought, and finally in verse 42, it says they thought more of the praise of men than they did of the things of God.
God help us when we get to the place where we think, when we care more about what people think than what he thinks. Somebody says something to me that I don't like, I get offended and I quit. Who was I, do, who was I doing it for if I do that? I wasn't doing it for the Lord because if I'm doing it for him, I can't quit until he says so. We need to get our eyes off the folks. Who are we trying to impress? Who is so important that it bears walking away from Jesus so they'll think we're better? Or being quiet even still. Knowing the truth. Knowing what's right when we keep our mouths shut. Because we don't want to offend him. What's the praise of men worth to you? Well, I want to wrap up and we're going to do this hopefully fairly quickly. Three things I want you to remember from today. First of all, salvation is for everybody. It's not for a particular type. We see a lot of different people in this chapter, don't we? We see Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We see the crowds that follow Jesus on Palm Sunday. We see the Greeks that come. People walk different walks of life. We're not meeting in this room today, but look around you. Do we all look alike? Do we all talk alike? Do we all dress alike? Do we all think alike? No. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's not just for us. You know what? There's... There's not just white folks in heaven. There's not just black folks in heaven. There's not just Americans in heaven. The Bible says that God has called people from every language and race and people and tribe under the heavens. The gospel is for everyone. If you want true equality, you come to the gospel because that's where you find it. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or what you're like. God loves you and you are welcome in his family. Secondly, worship is not just limited to particular times. Saturday, we see Mary in a house worshiping Jesus. On Sunday, we see the folks walking down the road, and they're proclaiming him king. They're worshiping him. If the only time you worship the Lord is when you come here, but it's on Sunday morning from 1030 to 1130, I want you to know you can do, you, there are times of worship all week long. Take the time to worship him. And finally, Christianity is all about being selfless. I want us to read verses 24 to 26. I've kind of passed by them until now. The Greeks have come looking for Jesus. The, the disciples bring them to Jesus. And then Jesus makes a statement. And you look at it and you think, man, I don't really get what he's trying to say to them. But I want you to understand what he's saying. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels. It's a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. What is he saying? Now, partly he's speaking about his death and what he's about to do. But partly he's telling these Greeks, if you're going to follow me, this is what it means. This is what it's about. You're going you're gonna to need to give up your life. You know, we're Americans, man. This is the me time, right? I live for me and me alone, and I make my decisions, and, and I determine the way that I live. And the gospel says, if you're going to follow me, Jesus says, you're going to have to give up your life. That's the essence of Christianity. It's not about me. It's about him. If it's about me, that's not Christianity. That's me. It's my worship in me. If it's about what I want and what I need and, and, and you know, how I feel... And I'm not thinking about anybody else. That's not Christianity. Jesus, the Bible says, he came to do what? Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. He's our example. That is Christianity right there. And he goes on to say, I am, I, those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Think about what he's saying. Those who love me more than life. Those are the ones who are going to go to heaven. 
those who understand that there's nothing more important than living for Jesus. Then he goes on to say, anyone who wants to say to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. I think we see the essence of Christianity in Jesus' words here. Giving, giving my life, loving, loving Jesus more than life itself and serving, serving as Jesus served us. You want to know what it's like to be a Christian? That's what it is like to be. That's true biblical Christianity. And by the way, I don't want you to take this and use it as a measurement to decide how somebody else is, is serving Jesus and how good a Christian they are. That's not what it's about. You take this passage and you look at it with your life in mind. Because Christianity, Christianity for you isn't about what somebody else is doing. It's about you and him. And that's it. It always that bothers me when people say, well, you look at Christianity and you look at Christians, and I don't want any part of that because of Christians. If you're looking at Christians, you're looking at the wrong place. Look at Jesus. He is Christianity. Now, if you walk away, you reject Jesus. I may not like that, but I can respect that. But don't get caught up in trying to look and follow somebody else. Follow another man who's just like you, who's going to have failures and flaws and all those things. Follow Jesus Christ. I think if it was my last week, that'd be a good way to live it, wouldn't it? Giving everything I've got to him. Loving him with all of my heart until my final breath. And then serving others as I serve him. Serving as Jesus served. Would that be a good way to spend my final week and your final week? I think that'd be a good way to live this week. In fact, we probably ought to live every week like that because this could be our final week. I will say this, and I want to finish with this. I don't know what Jesus went through that week. My time may be up Friday, I don't know. Jesus knew that. But I do know one thing, I need a Savior. And if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus, don't tell me about how your grandfather used to be a preacher. Don't tell me about how, you know, you've done real nice things this week. If you have never invited Jesus Christ into your life, if he is not the one you live for, then you need to understand the words of John. In John chapter 14, he says, this is the words of Jesus, actually. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying, if you want to go to heaven, I'm the only way. And that's the truth. That's it. And so let me ask you this. Are you following the way? There's a way that gets me to Kansas City, but it's not going east on 70, it's going west on 70, right? If I go east, I'm never getting to Kansas City. If I want to go to heaven, there's one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's no other way. No other road, no other way will get me there. If that seems exclusive, if that seems kind of uh, elitist to you, I'm sorry, but that's what the scripture says. It's the words of Jesus. There is one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I offer him to you today that you can invite him to be your Savior right now. Let's bow our heads. Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for the privilege to be in your presence today. Thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, thank you for such a wonderful example for us to follow. Lord, help us to live each day, each week, as if this were our last. May we make every day count for you. May I live with integrity every day this week. 
May I live with joy every day this week. May I live with love in my heart for others every day this week. May I serve as you serve me. Help me to serve others in the same way. Lord, may this be our lives as Jesus' followers. Lord, I pray for anyone who's here in this, in this service this morning or anyone who's listening to my voice who has never made that decision about Jesus. That this day, this moment, right now, they would simply pray that prayer, inviting you into their heart, and getting on that way that leads to life, that leads to heaven. If you're here today without Jesus and you want to invite him into your life, I offer this prayer as a model. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me, for taking my place, my pain, my sins upon yourself. Thank you for loving me so much. I want to live my life for you. I confess that I'm a sinner and I need you. Lord, I'm not trying to save myself any other way. You're my hope. And Lord, I offer my life to you. Take it and use it for your glory. Just as you pray to your Father on, at the cross, may you be glorified. Lord, may we pray that prayer as well. Lord Jesus, may you be glorified in my life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, tell somebody about it today. It's too good a news to keep to yourself. Well, let's stand and uh, we'll wrap up the service. Thank you for being here this morning. And. Uh, just look forward. And remember next week our uh, open air uh, service. And uh, so be sure to bring some lawn chairs and bring lunch with you. We'll have lunch together after the service. Okay? If you're going to be traveling, we'll be praying for God to give you safety. If you haven't signed the card for Phyllis, please do so. I'm going to assume it's somewhere. Does anybody know where the card is? <laughs> it's back on the table, maybe in the back. So uh, be looking for it on your way out. Okay, anything? I think we're good. Let's bow. Let's uh, pray. And uh, enjoy the day God has given us. Great. Dismiss us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this chance for us to meet here and learn for a time to worship you more. We ask that you help us to keep these things that we've learned today in our minds throughout the week.